And I think the reason why the Nobel Committee made me a game theorist, I think two things. One, I was able, after studying the Luce and Rafa book, I was able to translate many of my ideas into game theoretic terms. And I did. And that made it look as though what I was doing was game theory. And it really was, but it was before game theory existed. As before game theory had a name, I called it bargaining theory. Right. Yeah, I, I think applied to residential decisions. I, I somehow got interested in studying black white separation residentially. And I was stunned at what I found. segregation was so nearly complete in so many places, Chicago, Boston, New York, anywhere. And that led me to be interested in how does it come about? Is it all there from the beginning? Or does segregation happen when people start moving to where they fit in better. And that got me interested in what would it take to cause somebody to choose a particular place? What? It's pretty easy to see that if you, if you simply want a most white neighborhood a neighborhood that is two-thirds white and one-third black looks like an easy choice. But uh, if what matters is how close you are to where you work and what you can afford and a lot of other things, then the question was, how, how much of a black-white differential will throw the choice in one direction or the other? And that then, the, the concept of the, the, the terminology tipping point was not mine. It, it, I'd come across it elsewhere. But, uh, it, it, seemed, it seemed like a, a good term. And so I began to diagram different tipping points in terms of how much of a discrepancy would lead to actual choices and how would that lead to a, you know, an avalanche. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it was you know, partly just a matter of curiosity to work on that. I was in L.A. airport getting ready to catch a plane to go back to Boston when somebody, I was in a bookstore, some friend of mine picked up a book called Red Alert and told me to read it on the way home. Well, I did, and it was what eventually became Strange Love. And what happened was that I was writing about surprise attack or something for 
a journal. Or, no, I was just writing about how war might begin. And I said, none of the academic writing on how a war might begin compares with some of the fiction that is available. And there were oh, half a dozen books. And I picked three of them in particular and reviewed them. And I picked my favorite, which was Red Alert. And uh, this was published in the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And a good friend of mine in Britain who had been Washington correspondent for a London weekly newspaper read it and got the, I forget the name of that London newspaper, it was a Saturday paper. It, it, it was in two sections, a news section and a feature section. And it reprinted my whole article on the front of its feature section. And Stanley Kubrick, the movie producer, mm -hmm. was in London and who read that and he inquired to the address of the author and offered him $60,000 to come to Washington, come to the United States and work on a screenplay. And so Stanley Kubrick, the movie producer or director and uh, the author, came to my house and spent all afternoon and then dinner, trying to bring Red Alert up to date because when Red Alert came out, there were no ballistic missiles. It was just airplanes. And we had to find a plausible way to get the war starter, including ballistic missiles. And I don't think we ever reached a satisfying solution to the problem. I even invited in a couple of friends of mine whom I'd met at Rand and who were interested in this question, invited them for dinner, I think. And, uh, but they, they had the author of Red Alert And he helped them figure out that we're going to have to have a, a certain amount of irresponsibility somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that might mean putting some humor in it. And I think it came out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs>